morning everybody. This piece is called The Three Kings, The Three Magi, which would fit in with our reading for the day. The chorale tune is harmonised by Mendelssohn, and then an English composer of Victorian times, Peter Cornelius, wove a melody around the chorale, and I shall try and intersperse both Mendelssohn and Cornelius in this little rendition that tells the story of the three kings travelling to Bethlehem. Thank you, Peter. Next time we're worshipping back in the Christ's Church, while appreciating your wonderful music making, I think I'm going to find myself picturing your rainbow socks hidden up there in the organ gallery. Now, we may be um, welcoming some people from our Longerville Sister Uniting Church this morning. Cricor, unfortunately, has COVID and was unable to uh, prepare worship for you this week. Um, I can't see who's uh, here online, um, but maybe somebody from Longerville, if you're online, would be able to update us on Quickor. Is there anybody who might be able to do that? You will need to unmute yourself in order to uh, let us know. Krikor has said he's without, uh, he has no symptoms now. Right. He, he did have a rough patch for a few days, but he said he's feeling much better now. But he will be off for another week resting. So uh, we're just Spectre. praying that he will be, everything will be well. And he's staying away from the twins <laughs> and everybody else, of course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Virginia, I'm assuming, from uh, your name yes. on, on there, um, yes. and uh, welcome. Uh, Virginia, Can I don't know whether you can see other people present and whether other people from Longerville as well? No, I can't. No? No. You, you can't see, okay. All no. right. Well, well, we do welcome anybody else who's uh, joining us. 
Um, I myself am visiting Crow's Nest at the moment this month. I'm Ian Pearson, and I'm filling in for Michael, who is uh, on leave this month. Well, we invite everybody to make yourself very much at home. I invite you to actually to mute yourself now, unless you're actually speaking. Um, and then there will be time later on in the service when uh, we'll provide an opportunity for everybody or anybody, not everybody at once, but anybody to speak. Long before cartoonists drew light bulbs above people's heads to signify moments of insight, lights have shone from distant stars, which inspired awe in human spirits in search of something like God. Epiphany, which begins today, is the light bulb season of the Christian church, the aha season. Actually, it began on the 6th of January, uh, because, but because the 6th of January is not a Sunday, then the church, uh, this is the first opportunity in church for, for most of the people in the world to begin the season of Epiphany. Let us begin our worship of God today in awe and wonder as we sing in our own homes, led by Peter from the organ bench, Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness, shining.
I invite you to respond in the words that you can see there uh, bolded, uh, italicized and in purple on the screen. Um, we, we don't have everybody switched on at once because the internet is in different speeds and different homes and it sounds more like a rabble than a community. Uh, so <coughs> we will hear ourselves, but in the knowledge that other people are speaking these words along with us. Among the poor, among the proud, among the persecuted, among the privileged, the spirit of Christ Jesus is among us, making all things new. In the private house, in the public square, in the wedding feast, in the seats of government, the spirit of Christ Jesus is among us, making all things new. With a gentle touch, with a reproving word, with a clear conscience, with burning love, the spirit of Christ Jesus is among us, making all things new. That God's kingdom may come, that the world might laugh with joy, that the tyrants may stumble, that the hidden might be seen, the spirit of Christ Jesus is among us, making all things new. Within us, beyond us, behind us, before us, within this place, in every place, for this time, for all time, the spirit of Christ Jesus is among us, making all things new. I can't see if there are young people present, but I will assume there are. And at the same time, of course, there is a young person in the midst of all of us. I want to talk about how much you young people bring to us adults and how wonderful it is to have you teach us. Now, that might surprise you that you teach adults. And I was surprised, too, when I first became a dad, how my baby child taught me so much that I had forgotten because I thought of myself as a wise adult. I remember one day holding my new baby child in my arms and all of a sudden her eyes became alert and I wound my memory back and heard in my memory a bird singing outside of the room that we were in. She noticed and I hadn't until she noticed and I thought how wonderful that bird sound brings so much music to our lives, music which I had lost in that moment because I hadn't noticed, but she had. And as she grew, I saw how she was interested in so many things that I take for granted. For instance, ants, you know, crawling a, a, along the ground or in a window or something like that on a kitchen bench. Now she was so intrigued by these. And I saw the ants, of course, but they didn't carry for me the same kind of wonder that they did for her. And she taught me wonder again, because I had forgotten about it as what I thought of myself as being a, uh, a mature adult. You know, kids have ways of seeing things that we 
adults need to learn and rehear. Now you do that just by being who you are. And we're so grateful that you are who you are. But just be aware that although of course we adults do teach you things and you notice those, those times, you might not notice those times when we adults are learning or relearning something from you. We thank you for those and for all the adults living, uh, or listening, I mean, we're all living, for all the adults listening, maybe when a child in our presence brings us to a moment of epiphany again or for the first time, we might appreciate them and let them know how much we value what they have taught us simply by being who they are. So thank you kids for who you are. Thank you for teaching us adults, even when you don't know that you are. And we thank each other for being who we are because that is part of being the people of God. Let us pray. God, we thank you for so many things. We thank you that we can run and we can jump and we can tumble and we can talk and we can listen and hear and notice so many fabulous things in the world that you have made. We thank you for mums and dads and uncles and aunts and cousins and grandparents, for all those people who walk with us through life, who notice things together so that we can really enjoy life and each other and give thanks to you who made all of this possible for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's sing our next hymn with the eyes of a child. You kids will be able to do this very easily, but we adults need to remind ourselves to see more and more. This hymn is new to most of us. So let me just play the melody through for the first verse and then we'll all sing it together. This is how it goes. see if I can carry the tune as well. One, two, one, two. Lord, let me see, see more and more. See the beauty of a person, not the colour of their skin. See the faces of the homeless, there's no one to take them in. See this marriagement because you'll never win. Be the face of a heart in the pain. Lord, let me see. Lord, let me hear, hear more and more. Hear the sounds of great rejoicing. Hear a person barely sigh. Hear the ring of truth and hollowness of those who live a lot. Hear the wail of starving people who will die. Hear the voice of to yourselves now.
when Jesus invited us to come to God like a child, it seems to me that among the things or the characteristics of children he's inviting us to participate in is a characteristic of humility, of not knowing, of knowing that others might know more than we do. That hymn is a kind of a prayer of confession, a prayer in humility, if you like, that we've sung together. And the word to us in Christ Jesus is never less than grace upon grace. This is the miracle of hope which Christ Jesus brings. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now uh, let us hear a gospel reading set down in the Church's International Lectionary. Actually, not for today, the first Sunday in Epiphany, but for the day of Epiphany itself, which is the 6th of January. Let us listen for words of faith in the gospel. Your Lord, word, O Lord, is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them. He sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And, having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. For the word of the Lord for the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God.
there's a wonder-filled Islamic parable, also attributed centuries later to the life of the Catholic mystic Teresa of Avila, a powerful insightful led as, as in powerful insight for legends are often so cast and retold from the mouths or in the life of another person there's a wonderful islamic saga parable about the sufi prophetess rabia al-basri who was seen one day running urgently through the streets of basra carrying a flaming torch in one hand and a bucket of water in the other. And when asked what was so urgent, she said angrily, with this bucket of water, I'm going to put out the fires of hell. And with this fire, I'm going to burn down the mansions of heaven. And then we'll see who really loves God. This marvelous insight which came to me unexpectedly first through the Islamic parable about Rabia al-Basri and only secondly through Teresa of Avila, this wonderful insight invites me to consider, excuse me, <coughs> whether my faith in God is powered by an anxiety about God's future judgment for me and God's awarding of eternal timeshares in heaven or alternatively in hell, or whether my faith is powered by the simple wonders of being joyfully alive, like a child simply glorifying in what her body can now do, which once she was unable to accomplish. With this bucket of water, said the prophet, I am going to quench the threatening fires of hell. With this fire, I'm going to burn down the beckoning mansions of heaven, and then we'll see who really loves God. It's a parable about motivation. I do not want to worship God either from fear of his punishment, although in a less enlightened time of my life, I certainly did that. Nor from the bribe of God's reward of heaven, although there have been times when I have done that. These days I like simply to love God because God is, and because God is, you and I and this universe of space, time and matter wonderfully also are. I want to love God and to worship God simply because God is. And because God is, you and I, and this universe of space, time, and matter wonderfully are. Well, unexpectedly for me, it was an Islamic prophetess who enlarged in me this insight, this epiphany, this aha moment in my own Christian faith journey. I find so interesting the surprisingly humble, even despised and outcast characters who turn up that first Christmas according to the two biblical parables of Jesus' birth found in Matthew and in Luke. You'd think, you'd think that Matthew and Luke, each of whom, whom will later speak of this child's kingdom, you'd think that they would have people at the birth of the parables of Jesus with the kind, what well, they would people the birth parables of Jesus with the kind of characters found near a royal birth, uh, a Macquarie Street obstetrician, for instance or Harley Street, because we don't have royalty in Australia, do we? A, a midwife lady-in-waiting, a, a royal court stenographer to record the details of this birth. You'd think there would be an anxious father pacing up and down the corridor outside with a crown on his head. You'd think this royal child 
would be born in a plush birthing suite, which itself might have a long distinguished pedigree of being the scene of other royal births. But no, Luke and Matthew decidedly people their birth parables of Jesus in an inauspicious animal stall, in an out of the way backwards town, in a no account country, in fact, a vassal country located in the boondocks of the vast, powerful, invading Roman superpower. It is an ironic king, Luke and Matthew will later speak of in their great parable good news reflections of Jesus' life. A king with no royal court, a king no one knew to be such at his own time of birth, a king with no power, a king with the only influence that can be found in a newly born child. You call that a knife, said the theologian Crocodile Dundee, as he's being held up in a New York subway, do you remember? This is a knife, he says, brandishing the largest, meanest mother of a knife you could ever expect to find. In a reversal of that universally expected trope, Matthew and Luke will later point to Rome's Caesar and Caesarea's more local king and say, you call that kingship? This is kingship, they will say, as they point ironically to a powerless peasant prophet, Jesus, far away from any center of visible power. In anticipation of this later move in their storytelling, their telling of their enthusiasm for Jesus, Matthew and Luke set up their later ironic point in their early chapters as they write of the birth of a defenseless peasant child and the low rent characters who attended this birth. Angels sing in Luke's story, of course, but Nobody significant hears them. The child's prospective aunt Elizabeth sings, of course, as does his no account prospective mother, Mary, but no one of any note hears them either. While this birth linked Jesus to the time space continuum dating back to the Big Bang as every child's birth does, no reputable person, even according to the mores of the boondocks of Bethlehem, had any idea of the consequences of this everyday birth. Isn't it interesting to find such a low brow cast of characters who testify to the wonders of this life begun in such inauspicious circumstances? Today we experience Matthew's surprising story about the suspicious non-Jewish characters who turn up out of the blue to acknowledge this humble birth. Tradition has enlarged the importance of these people and reduced the scandal of their identity. We imagine significant potentates as we sing we three kings of Orient are. We picture their finery and even their names, Caspar, and Balthazar and Melchior, and we count three of them. None of these details are in fact in Matthew's original telling of this story. Matthew simply calls them magi, not kings, not potentates, more like astrologers, men with mysterious divining tools, men whose craft has in fact been vigorously discouraged in the faith history of Israel. We can find that in many places in our scriptures. 
They're not only foreigners from whom you would not normally expect to hear Jewish wisdom. They are suspicious voodoo dispensers from whom you would never expect to hear any godly wisdom. They are simply characters in Matthew's telling in the conga line of those low rent, suspicious people who are the ones who notice Jesus' birth in contrast to the royal ones and the priestly ones sitting in their palaces and places of worship. Matthew's plot point of the Magi, it seems to me, invites us specifically today to notice the wisdom, the insight, the faith enhancing encounters we may have with people we do not expect to experience it from in the living of our lives. Now we licensed clergy like to think that we have something to offer to Christian community as I'm trying to do now when we gather for worship because we've been exposed to the theological academy and our faith has been examined by the church at large. While I don't want to discount completely what we might bring to wonder and faith-filled community, I do want to join Matthew invite, in inviting you to listen for aha moments, moments full of epiphany insight, which may come to us from unexpected, maybe even very unlikely sources. Maybe you can bring to mind such experiences in your own life memory now. I want to invite you today, like Matthew, to notice those aha moments which come to us unexpectedly perhaps through someone of another faith or even with no faith. Because God, it seems to Matthew and Luke, as they write their different but related parables of Jesus' birth, God invites us today to look also beyond the expected places in order to get some impression of the wonder and the size of God's wonder-filled grace. Amen. I'm going to invite you now, one person at a time, to um, speak out loud if you would like to, or, but, or simply to reflect quietly um, to yourself about what experiences you may have noticed from unexpected sources, maybe from people of other faiths or no faith, which have enriched you in your living. Now, this is being recorded. Uh, if you don't wish your face to appear, then simply stop the video uh, on your screen there somewhere, as some people already have. Um, and, and then you can still listen in on to what um, others are saying. Uh, Mahajan, is that enough of an introduction, do you think, for, for how to deal yourself out of the recording? Yes, I think so. It just so, so keep your videos muted uh, and unmute your microphone when you want to speak. Okay, um, thank and you. And un unmute it uh, when you finish. Thank you. Do you have a screen in which you can see most people, Mahajan? Yes. Okay. So can I get you to moderate this? I I will jump in at some occasions, but uh, there might be just indicate by raising your hand or waving uh, at Mahajan, and he will uh, uh, let you in, but you will need to unmute yourself and reminding you that, uh, that I'm inviting you to speak of experiences that you might have noticed from unexpected sources. 
especially today uh, on Epiphany, from people of other faiths or no faith, but you don't need to limit yourself to that. Uh, but experiences which have enriched you in your living, which have been provoked by uh, encounters with um, people uh, when you might not have expected them. So signify from Mahajan and unmute yourself. Or John, or just unmute and speak, I guess. I didn't catch that. Say that again. Or just unmute and speak. Un unmute and speak, yes. <laughs> Shall I uh, uh, just mention one person, Get a bit Ian? Yeah. I'll just come close to say, can you? Uh, Lynn and I have a friend who is a Buddhist. Yeah. He's such a wise man. He uh, He's just, I put in inverted commas, just. Uh, he's been a public servant. He's not a person who's risen to great heights in anything he's done. Uh, well, we would say from a, from a career perspective, but yet, He's an enormously wise person, and just to spend time with him is always a learning experience. Mm -hmm. um, he never criticizes uh, our Christian faith, um, just accept it. it. It is, he says, just to, I hope we don't make any sort of comments about his Buddhist faith. Um, he walks around in ordinary clothes with a coat and tie like everybody else, no robes or saffron or begging for rice. He's just a person in the street uh, but it brings such wisdom and insight that um it's always such a privilege just to spend time with him so that's, yeah. that's my experience thanks peter we can experience the fruits of uh, god's spirit uh, in many places can't we somebody else like to offer something here Cheryl. Cheryl, yeah. Um, it was something actually you mentioned, I think, last week, Ian, and it was a bit of an aha moment for myself quite a few years ago. Um, we have Hindu friends, and um, our Hindu friend was explaining their tradition of, you know, the, the greeting and the namaste, which is uh, really about their belief that the light is in each person and that's there and so that is a greeting from their light to the recipient recipient's light mm. um and it made me realize how similar some of the foundations of religion are mm. even though hinduism is not one of those abrahamic religions mm. um it had that same core thinking and that for me was a bit of an aha moment yeah. thanks cheryl and people from longerville you don't have to serve time in order to speak here uh, so anybody can respond am i unmuted i can hear somebody mm -hmm. yes chris it's chris, it's chris from longerville this is not an epiphany moment, but we were traveling in New Zealand uh, a few years back and we got to the very top of the North Island. And New Zealand was discovered by Abel Tasman, Abel Tasman several centuries ago. And he apparently discovered the top of New Zealand on um, the day of epiphany. And there are three islands there that he, call, that he called after the three wise men, but the trio is called the Epiphany Islands. Mm. Yeah. So I thought that oh, was interesting. interesting. Yeah, when I, yes. when I discovered that, I was very impressed. Well, yes, and that clearly they were aware of the tradition of epiphany in the shape of their um, church calendar uh, at the time. Thank you for that. I spoke about the epiphany which came to me on hearing the parable uh, of the Islamic prophetess. I had an epiphany once also when I was um, in conversation with a, a then Islamic man who subsequently became Christian. 
And he was talking to me about the 99 or the 100 names of Allah. Now, they're not, Allah, of course, is simply the Arabic name for God. Arabic Christian or Christians worshipping in Arabic um, pray Allah uh, in their prayers. Well, Tariq was uh, telling me about the 99 or 100 names in God, which are not intended to be taken literally as a number, but are intended to be taken as uh, the many names of God. Notwithstanding um, Cheryl pointing us to the fact that in the Abrahamic religions, we tend to think of one God, um, that one God is we, we reflect in uh, with many, many images. Um, so we think of God, the, the baker woman, for instance, in uh, one of Jesus' parables, who um, um, puts a pinch of yeast into a flower. Or we think of uh, God, the burglar, um, again from Jesus' lips, who um, comes into our lives in moments we uh, least expect him or her to. Uh, but so it awakened me this sense of the 99 or 100 names of God to many of the names within our Christian tradition, um, many of the images which we use to reach after the, uh, the mystery of God. So that was a, an epiphany moment for me, in this case from an Islamic man. But of course, um, I've experienced that from people from many sources of life. So there's perhaps time for one more person if somebody wants to see something. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll condense a long story, hopefully to a shorter story, um, because it involves what you say about children and um, uh, epiphany moments with children. Um, my daughter was going on a Baptist mission to Bangladesh, mm -hmm. and my wife and I said, well, you know, that's just not on you know she doesn't understand the implications and I travel widely all around Asia so I thought the next trip I do you come with me and I'll just give you an experience because I don't really think this is appropriate <laughs> so we went off to Thailand and um, lo and behold the Baptist mission and uh, people had contacts in Thailand and she said I'd like to go to a couple of places while we're in uh, Thailand and I said yeah that's fine but you know let me just show you around and you know you'll see Asia is a very different place so the first place we went to was an AIDS orphanage and suddenly the teacher was being taught on things that I had never seen in Asia uh, we went to the AIDS orphanage and we saw a couple of Australians who had done a marvelous job then we went uh, into Bangkok and um, there was uh, a group that was retraining prostitutes um, in such things as hairdressing and making trinkets. And um, so suddenly I was on a journey of discovery when I thought I was going to give her a, joy, a journey of discovery. Mm -hmm. The end result is she went off to Bangladesh and had a wonderful time. <laughs> Terrific. I hope to be learning until my last breath, I must say. <laughs> And uh, so to learn humility from our children uh, which is a bit surprising, <laughs> a bit sobering sometimes too. Well, thank you all. And I'm sure that um, others of you have experiences that uh, you could relate as well. But let us um, now move to our next hymn. Brightest and best of the children of morning, dawn on our darkness and lend us your aid. A guide where our infant redeemer is laid. So it's an invitation for us to hear something profound uh, in, um, well, places we might least expect. Let's sing together.
I invite you to join me in uh, affirming our intended action as a result of the grace of God in our own lives. Again, here with your response to the um, bold italicized, with the bold italicized words. We seek here to celebrate human diversity, including spirituality, ethnicity, gender, and sexual identity. We seek to create a space where people of any faith and none can question and discover the sacred in life through openness, struggle, laughter, and prayer. We seek to be in solidarity with poor and marginalized people and to cherish creation. We don't manage it all the time, so we try again. Amen. Now, let me invite somebody from Longerville to uh, bring any notices that you are aware of uh, that it would be good for your community and us at Crow's Nest to hear. You'll need to unmute yourself in order to speak. Maybe somebody from Longerville. Christine should be doing that as our leader. <laughs> Christine, you've been dobbed in. <laughs> okay, I'm here. I'm yeah, just thinking there's, there's nothing much happening in the month of January, right. but our activities do resume in, <coughs> in February. Um, the movie night, I think it's the 1st of February, and time for you commencing on the 2nd of February. And our church meetings of elders and church council, uh, I think the second Wednesday. I haven't got the information in front of me, mm -hmm. but we have all been informed of what's going on. Thank and you, we'll be Christine. informed before the end of the month. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there may be some people from either congregation who joined us late. Um, Krikor, uh, who uh, ministers in Longerville, is um, unwell with COVID, although recovering well. And that's why you've been invited to uh, join us. And we're delighted to have your presence with us. So now notices from uh, Crow's Nest. Um, good morning, everyone. I'll be brief. Um, the directory has been emailed to everyone, but when we do get back to church, there are paper copies available. And with COVID circulating, if you are forced to isolate or you need some uh, groceries delivered or just some help, can you please reach out to us, either to me or someone in the church council. And please read the rosters. Uh, I think we need a reader for next week. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jill. Well, we invite ourselves um, in church and especially in lockdown when it's not so easy to do to uh, make our offerings through direct debit uh, or through a, a check sent to uh, the treasurer of our own congregations, um, especially in lockdown because the, um, the costs of uh, community continue uh, and it enables us as Christian people, not only to be community together, but also enables us to serve others both near and far. Let us pray over our gifts in gratefulness to God. God and giver of every good thing, we bring to you lives and gifts for your kingdom. As we respond to your transformation, transforming grace and love, made known in Christ Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. So now we come to our prayers 
of hope and longing. If you'd like to respond after you hear the words, God in your mercy, in your homes, with the words, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Life-giving God, we bring to you our prayers for the world and for the church. At the dawn of time, your spirit hovered over the waters of the deep and brought form and life to your creation. Overshadow your world today and give to us a new sense of wonder and responsibility for this planet and all its creatures. God, in your mercy, hear our, hear prayer. our prayer. In the days of the great flood, you saved Noah from the waters of death and made a covenant with Noah and his descendants. Look with compassion today on all in danger from natural disaster and from those catastrophes that we inflict on ourselves. Mm -hmm. God, in your mercy, hear, hear our, prayer. our prayer. In ancient times, you brought your chosen people from slavery to freedom through the waters of the Red Sea. Liberate your people today who are held in the bondage of cruelty, oppression, or injustice, so they may live in dignity, freedom, and hope. God, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. In the waters of the River Jordan, your son, Jesus Christ, was baptised with those he came to save. Bring your people today to seek the salvation that you offer, so we may turn away from all that holds us in the power of evil. God, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Through the waters of baptism, you seal us as your own and make us one with all who bear your name. Empower us with your spirit to faithfully serve you and proclaim your good news of justice, peace, redemption, and love. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. At Jesus' baptism, you named him your beloved son and anointed him with power for ministry. Bring healing today to those who are sick, hope, for those in despair and comfort to the lost and lonely ones of our community. God, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Ever living God, by the death and resurrection of your son, you bring us to new and everlasting life. May we so pattern our lives on your son that we also may be found pleasing in your eyes and take our place with your beloved daughters and sons of every time and nation. God, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. And if we could all join together at home in the Lord's Prayer. Our, our Father, in, Father heaven, in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be your name. Your, name. your, your kingdom, kingdom come. come. Your, your will, will be done, done on earth, on earth as, as in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us today, today our, our daily, daily bread. bread. Forgive, us forgive us our sins, sins as, we as we forgive, forgive those who sin against, against us. Save us in, in the time, time of trial and, and deliver us from evil. From evil. For, the For the kingdom, kingdom the power and, and the glory and are yours now and forever. forever. Amen. Thank you, Margaret, for that wonderful prayer. It's our tradition um, at the end, here at uh, Crow's Nest after the service is concluded to hang around and just meet with each other online. Uh, we invite uh, Longerville people to join in that as well uh, in a few moments. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Friends, go in freedom and faith to the church. God's people, wherever this new year may take you, may the holy God surprise you on the way, Christ Jesus take you by the hand, and the Spirit of God light your path. Amen.